Hello and welcome to Nature Live Online. I'm Alison, I'm your host for today's talks. Now, if you've been following our Nature Lives, brilliant, welcome back. For those of you who are new to Nature Live, so we're the online version of an event that usually happens at the Natural History Museum in London, where we give our visitors a chance to meet and speak with some of the scientific staff at the museum and find out a little bit more about the work, the research that goes on behind the scenes. Now, we can't safely be at the museum at the moment, so instead we're bringing our science and our scientists direct to your homes. Now, today I am very pleased to be joined by Chris Stringer origins expert we're going to be talking about the neanderthals now i've got lots and lots of questions for chris but i know you will have some too so please please don't be shy if you have a question at any point during the stream post it in the comments we'll do our very best to, uh, to answer as many of your questions as we can we often get quite a few but we'll do our best to answer as many as we can but let's meet our speaker today chris are you there can you hear us I can hear you, Alison. Uh, yeah, yeah. Hi. Brilliant. Thank you so Pleasure much for joining to us. Good to be with you. Let's start by by finding out uh, your role at the museum, your, your area of research. Hi Chris, so did you hear that? Uh, we're just going to find out a little bit about what you do at the museum. Yeah, you're breaking up a bit, Alison, but I think that was about my role at the museum. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I'm a researcher. That's my main activity. So I spend most of my time actually researching on, on topics in human evolution, such as the Neanderthals and their relationship to us. But of course, my job involves many other things at the museum, uh, including outreach activities. So uh, I do media, I do presentations like this. Um, and I'm involved in exhibition work. So I was involved in our human evolution exhibition, uh, which has been open for a few years now. It's a brilliant exhibition and we, we hope to be getting back to it as soon as we can. Did you always have an interest in, in anthropology? How did you come to, to study human origins? Well, yeah, I had interest even as a small child. So I was interested in fossils, in dinosaurs, of course, but in, including early humans. So I think I was about nine years old and I did a school topic on Neanderthals. And I wish I still had it. So I had this long term interest, but I I certainly didn't think or dream that I could one day actually work on this subject at the Natural Museum. And it is, it's a fascinating subject, it's, it's one of my favourites. It, it's a, it's a, a really complex picture we're getting of our, our evolution, it's used to changing all the time. But Chris, we are currently the only human species on our planet. It wasn't always the case. Can you talk us through our evolutionary tree as it currently stands? Yes, yeah, so we think we shared a common ancestor with our closest living relatives, the chimpanzees, maybe seven million years ago. And so for the next five million years or so, human evolution happened, as far as we know, only in Africa. And there was a diversity of different species. Some were in there. There must be our actual ancestors, but there were certainly many others that diversified, went in their own evolutionary directions and eventually went extinct. And then we come into the last two million years and then we find true humans, members of the genus Homo, and we see the presence of humans outside of Africa for the first time. So in that last two million years, we've got the evolution of, of the species that we're going to be talking about today, uh, including us and the Neanderthals. And we do think that at one point there were at least five different species of human. Is that, is that right? 
Yes, well, whether we call the Denisovans, for example, a, a different species is, is, is argued about, but certainly five different kinds of humans at least. There may well have been more. Uh, we had been evolving in Africa up to that time. The Neanderthals were evolving in Europe and, and Asia. Over in Eastern Asia, we have Nisivans. And in Southeast Asia, we had these strange little dwarf species, Homo floresiensis and Homo luzonensis. Mm, fascinating finds. What is it that defines the, the human phase of our evolution? Is it um, anatomical? Is it behavioral? Well, archaeologists, of course, have their own uh, definitions based on behavioral complexity, you know, making stone tools and increasingly complex behavior. But from what's preserved in the skeletons in, as fossils, we can look at things like an enlarging brain compared with body size. We can look at the shape of the body, the fact we have relatively long legs and relatively short arms. We have uh, a human shaped rib cage. And in the skull, we have a relatively smaller face. Uh, we have smaller teeth relative to the creatures that lived before us. So these are all the sorts of features that we look for for the genus Homo, and particularly when we come to the later stages, us and the Neanderthal. Now, the, the Neanderthals were one of our closest relatives, and, and you've uh, spent your career studying them. Tell us a little bit about the Neanderthals. Who were they? Uh, where, when were they around? Yes, so the Neanderthals were around in Europe till at least 39,000 years ago. So they came really quite recently in time. Um, they lived in Europe and Asia. Um, they were a very successful species with an English history going on for several hundred thousand years. When was the first Neanderthal fossil discovered? Yes, yeah, so the, um, the Neanderthal that we know about, the best known one is the one from the Neander Valley in Germany. Um, and that was found in 1856. But this particular skull we're showing now, which is on our Human Evolution Exhibition, is the Neanderthal from Gibraltar. And that was found eight years earlier, but unfortunately it wasn't recognized for another 15 years. Um, so in the meantime, if you like. Um, but also a Neanderthal child had been discovered in Belgium in around 1830, and it took another 100 years for that to be recognized as a Neanderthal fossil. We've had a couple of questions coming uh, about the Neanderthals uh, range. One, someone on Facebook was asking, were Neanderthals limited to, to Europe? And another is asking on YouTube, um, uh, sorry, on, on Facebook, do we have any evidence of Neanderthals in Australia? Yeah, so we know that Neanderthals obviously were in much of Europe. We know they were in Asia. They were in Western Asia. And we know that from sites like Denisova Cave itself, they also were over in Siberia. Um, there's a fossil from China called Marpa, and that does even have some Neanderthal features. So the Neanderthals probably ranged quite widely across Asia at times. No evidence of them in Africa that we know of so far. And there's no evidence they went down into Southeast Asia or got as far as Australia. Mm -hmm. um, Chris, what's the, the relationship between the Neanderthals and, and modern humans? Can, do we know when they last shared a common ad? Well, yes. Yeah, so it's estimated from DNA that we shared a common ancestor with the Neanderthals maybe five or 600,000 years ago. Some people put it even a bit earlier. Um, and for a long time, I've argued that this species Homo heidelbergensis, which was around about 500,000 years ago, could have represented the common ancestor for us and the Neanderthals. So uh, heidelbergensis lived in Europe and, and Africa, pretty certainly in Asia. And then on my model that I had for many years, evolution then went in two different directions. In Europe and Asia, it gave rise to the Neanderthals. In Africa, it gave rise to us. 
So that was the view I had until the last few years. Of course, because because recent uh, research has, has has changed that view slightly. It's made it a bit more complicated. Yes, that's right. So we know the Neanderthal line goes deep in Europe, but we're beginning to see how deep the Sapiens line goes also in Africa. And we're starting to reevaluate what the common ancestor looked like. So first of all, it may have lived further back in time. And there's evidence now that Hydrobagensis, some examples at least, are too late to be our ancestors. So the Broken Hill Skull, which is a famous Hydrobagensis fossil from Zambia, um, that I was involved in a work which recently redated that fossil to maybe only 300,000 years. So that certainly is too late because we already had Homo sapiens in early Homo sapiens in Africa at that time. Um, but also there's evidence from the shape of the skull. So the face of Hydrobagensis now looks like it's not the face of our common ancestor. So we think the face of our common ancestor probably looked more like um, the fossils of Homo antecessor. Um, so if you look at this diagram here, Homo antecessor lived around 800,000 years ago in Spain. And the face of Homo antecessor looks actually more like the face we reconstruct now for our common ancestor with Neanderthals. So Neanderthals moved away from that face shape. So probably did Heidelbergensis, whereas Homo sapiens kept that primitive face shape um, through its evolution in Africa. So Hydebergensis may not be our common ancestor. The ancestor may have lived further back in time, and in some ways it may have looked more like Homo antecessor. It's absolutely fascinating. Now, you, now you mentioned that the, the face shape there. Neanderthals are obviously very recognizably human. They, they are a type of human, but there are quite a few differences between Neanderthals and modern humans. Can you talk us through those and why they might have arisen? Yeah, so you know, Neanderthals, as you said, they're, they're fully human. They've got big brains. They walked upright uh, as well as we do. Um, but their body shape is distinctive. It's, it's short and wide. They were very powerfully built, very heavily muscled, a very strong upper body, a very big rib cage and lung, big lungs inside there. Um, their pelvis was much wider than ours. Um, and in the skull, there are a number of differences. The looked at from behind, the Neanderthal skull looks almost spherical. Um, our skull is narrower at the base and expanded higher up. And when you look at the side view of the skulls, you know, we've got a globular brain case, very rounded, whereas the Neanderthals have a longer and lower brain case shape. They, of course, still had a long brow ridge over the eyes. Their face was distinctive was pulled forwards with a very large nose um, and they didn't have much on the lower jaw. And could those uh, differences be down to the environment that they were living in, some of them? Yeah, so um, we think that maybe the face shape could be partly down to uh, environment, that that big nose would have been a, an efficient means of warming up and humidifying the air. That in. Neanderthals had evolved in relatively cooler conditions, but also that nose isn't just an efficient way to move a lot of air through. The Neanderthals were active, they had big lungs, they were having to push a lot of air through that nasal system, so the nose is very big to allow that. Um, and their body shape is short and wide, and that's a good body shape to have in colder conditions because you conserve body heat. So, yeah, certainly they were influenced by the environment. Some of the other features we don't have an explanation for. Some of them could just be quirky differences. Once you separate populations, they can go in their own directions, even for rather random factors. And that maybe explains some of their odd features compared with us or equally some of our odd features compared with them. <laughs> We've had questions online about their, uh, the possibility that they had language. Callum, age 10, was asking how large were Neanderthals' vocal cords? Yes, yeah, so the vocal cords, of course, are, are soft tissue and don't preserve, but 
what we can say is that the Neanderthal's throat anatomy may have been a little bit different from ours. Some people model that the Neanderthals would have had higher pitch voices, which maybe doesn't go with that Neanderthal image. Um, but, um, but certainly there's no reason to doubt that they wouldn't have had the capability for language, for speech. So the question is whether their brains were, were producing that complexity and whether their way of lives demanded that complexity for the evolution of complex language. So I think the Neanderthals were certainly talking to each other, but personally, I doubt that their language, their everyday use of language was as complex as ours. I had a, a lovely question from Phoebe, age 11 on Facebook, asking, do we know what language they might have spoken? But I suppose we'll, we'll never know, will we? Uh, sadly not, no. No, I think that's that's one thing that we're not going to ever learn, sadly. Now, we know an awful lot about uh, Neanderthal uh, culture, how they lived. Tell us a little bit about that, because they were quite advanced, weren't they? They used tools, for example. Is that right? Yes, certainly Neanderthals were tool users and they made complex tools. So uh, here's a reconstruction, quite an old one now, by Maurice Wilson of Neanderthals in Gibraltar, in front of caves in Gibraltar. Um, and you can see there that Neanderthal woman is working some skins and uh, there are you know, birds in the background and animal bones. There's a spear. So we think that Neanderthals, you know, certainly made complex stone tools. Here are some that we excavated from Gibraltar in the 1990s. So you can see these tools. Some of them are, are beautifully made, different raw materials. They would have been very efficient for cutting and scraping, for butchering animal bones. Um, they had good hunting equipment, and they no doubt had equipment for digging up uh, plants and collecting plant resources as well. And here are some much older tools uh, from the site of Swanscombe. So this, this material could have been made by early Neanderthals 400,000 years ago um, in, in Britain. Um, they may have worked uh, material like antler and bone uh, to an extent, um, and certainly they had a variety of stone tools to help them with their everyday lives. Do we know much about, oh, we've got a, a picture of jewellery there. Do, do we know that they they, dress, they wore clothing, they wore jewellery, they, they dressed up, that type of thing? Yes, unfortunately, we don't have direct evidence of, of Neanderthal clothing surviving, but almost certainly they did have clothing. They had the technology to work skins. They certainly uh, um, were killing animals that, that would have had skins. And in cold conditions, almost certainly they had clothing to help them with that. They must have built shelters, uh, at least as windbreaks uh, and shelters from the environment. And here we've got evidence of perhaps even greater complexity. So these are eagle uh, talons from a site in uh, Croatia, from uh, the site of Krapina. Now, these are over a well over 100,000 years old, and experts have argued that these were being collected and worked and modified, potentially to wear as jewellery. So there's evidence Neanderthals were wearing jewellery, so they were engaging in that kind of complex behaviour that we used to think was exclusive to modern humans. Do we think that they there is evidence of them using art, symbolism, that type of thing? Yes, there are recent claims by some people that the Neanderthals also um, uh, did simple cave art um, producing dots and symbols on the wall of the caves in which they lived um, and there's evidence of some engraved marks on, on bones and even uh, parts of caves which were probably produced by Neanderthals. There's, a, there's evidence of very complex structure, stalagmites, 
termites uh, from a cave site uh, in France. So they only used to think. We have some evidence of, of burials as well, don't we? Do, do we think that they buried their dead? Yes, again, it's disputed, but I think there's good evidence Neanderthals buried their dead. We have relatively complete skeletons from a number of cave sites in Kibara uh, from about 60,000 years ago. It looks like the Neanderthals actually produced a burial pit and they put in this body of a human and originally even the skull was in the burial. Uh, we have one tooth from the upper jaw, um, so the skull has gone and we don't know whether the Neanderthals took it away. Uh, whether it was eroded away or maybe a hyena dug up uh, the head and, and went off with it. But certainly it looks like this was an intentional burial and we have a number of those from a number of Nisal sites. Chris, we've had a question online uh, on Facebook about their diets. Did they eat a similar diet to, to modern humans? Do we know? Yes, yeah, so they were hunter-gatherers, they were living off the land, uh, they were certainly capable of hunters and in Northern Europe, for example, they would have needed to be because in Europe, uh, Northern Europe in the winters, you would need to have uh, good supplies of meat to get you through the winter. So they were capable hunters, but they also uh, gathered plant resources and we know from deposits on their teeth, calculus, the tartar uh, that you have on your teeth, when that sets hard, uh, we call it calculus and we have calculus from Neanderthal teeth that actually has particles of their food in there and certainly it shows us that yes they were meat eaters but also they were collecting a variety of plant resources as well. We've had a question uh, another question on Facebook uh, asking is there evidence to suggest uh, cannibalism in Neanderthal society at all? Yes so not just for Neanderthals, but for a number of early species, um, Homo antecessor, uh, Heidelbergensis, our own species, Homo sapiens, there is evidence that cannibalism was going on. Um, you find human bones disposed of often with animals. Uh, the animal bones have been butchered and cut, and the human bones seem to have been treated the same way. So it looks like there was cannibalism going on in some Neanderthal groups. Um, we don't know the motivation, of course. Sometimes there's something called crisis cannibalism, where there's a shortage of food, let's say there's a bad winter, people die and other members of the group actually eat them purely for survival reasons. Uh, there's also sometimes, you know, ritual cannibalism within groups where you're eating some part of your dead relative uh, in order to keep their spirit or knowledge. Um, but equally, yes, there can be can cannibalism associated with violence between groups. So these are all possibilities for Neanderthal cannibalism. It certainly does seem to have occurred and we shouldn't single out the Neanderthals. It wasn't just happening in Neanderthals. Other human species, including our own, were doing this from time to time. It's interesting you mentioned the, the ritual idea. There. There's been another question on Facebook asking if there was any evidence that Neanderthals revered any particular animal species. Well, some people have argued that the prevalence of eagle remains, for example, in, in some Neanderthal sites suggests that eagles were especially important to Neanderthals, sometimes as evidence of cave bear material uh, in Neanderthal sites, so uh, possibly making jewellery out of cave bear teeth. Uh, so maybe there were animals that were important to Neanderthals, uh, I think it's obviously very difficult to to be sure about that and the archaeologists certainly have plenty of debate about that. 
Now, Chris, um, obviously the Neanderthals and modern humans, they went down uh, different evolutionary paths, but they did come back together again as, as modern humans migrated. What is the archaeological evidence that Neanderthals and modern humans lived closely together? Yeah, well, as we learn more, it, it's certainly possible that these groups came into contact um, a number of times over the hundreds of thousands of years that they were evolving. But the period we know best is the period between about 40,000 and 60,000 years ago. So we think modern humans having evolved in Africa started to emerge from there. And so in Western Asia, they would have come out maybe 60,000 years ago and they would have contacted some Neanderthals in that region. Later on, we have evidence of potential overlaps in Europe. Uh, between about 40 and 45,000 years ago. Uh, and of course, we'll come on to evidence from our DNA that there certainly was direct contact between us and the Neanderthals. There was a, a recent study that came out of uh, Bulgaria uh, about uh, the fact that humans and Neanderthals might have coexisted for longer than we thought, and perhaps they influenced one another's culture. What, what's your, your take on that? Yeah, so um, this is a recent publication of data from a site called Bachikiro, uh, a cave site in Bulgaria. And we knew that in Europe, the Neanderthals and modern humans did overlap around 40,000 years ago because we have stone tools associated with these groups and even some directly dated fossils that put those two groups at least in close proximity in Europe to each other. But this site in Bulgaria suggests that there were modern humans there probably 45, 46,000 years ago. So that suggests an even longer period of overlap and potential contact between us and the Neanderthals. So yes, it, it certainly was a, a, a long period of overlap in Western Asia and potentially even a relatively long period of overlap more than we thought in Europe. Mm. It's absolutely fascinating. But one thing we definitely know is that modern humans and Neanderthals interbred. Uh, how much Neanderthal DNA do, do people typically have in their genomes? Well, people outside of uh, Africa have around 2% uh, Neanderthal DNA on average. Uh, that includes me. I've had my, uh, my DNA tested. Um, people in Africa have a, a lower percentage on average, uh, sometimes a very smaller. Uh, but yes, there's certainly around the world, there's actually a lot of DNA when you put it all together. And uh, what's been the, the legacy of, of these interbreedings? Uh, are there specific traits uh, that we can identify as, as uh, coming from our Neanderthal relatives? Well, there's a lot of research going on on, on that particular topic. Um, and there are different views about it. But for example, it's thought that our immune systems owe something to the Neanderthals uh, because we had evolved in Africa. When we moved out of Africa into Europe and Asia, we, our ancestors would have been encountering new diseases they had no immunity to, whereas the Neanderthals probably had developed immunities to those diseases. So when interbreeding with the Neanderthals, we were able to give our immune systems a quick fix um, and that has stayed with us through to the present day. Um, so it was good news 40 or 50,000 years ago. Some scientists believe the downside is that now some autoimmune diseases are actually caused, at least partly, by the presence of Neanderthal DNA. So there were pluses and minuses in this interbreeding. Now, this interbreeding uh, uh, does raise a question. It's one that's come up uh, uh, from one of our viewers. Uh, so the interbreeding with uh, Denisovans and Neanderthals produced fertile offspring. Do you believe that modern humans are a separate species mm -hmm. from Neanderthals? Or simply uh, are ne ho Neanderthals and Denisovans, are they just subspecies of Homo sapiens? Yeah, that's an interesting question, and experts have different. So, I actually wrote something specifically about this on the NHM website, which I hope people will all go and read. Uh, but just to put it briefly, um, 
we know that closely related mammal species and bird species today can hybridize. It takes maybe millions of years for many species to develop full reproductive isolation. So we and the Neanderthals had separated five or 600,000 years ago. Interbreeding clearly was still possible, both with the Neanderthals and with the Denisovans. And we know from evidence the Neanderthals and Denisovans also interbred with each other at times. So interbreeding was going on. I think these were diverging groups, probably species, but they weren't diverse sufficiently that they couldn't do interbreed with each other, at least to an extent. We've, uh, we've got a question from uh, YouTube from one of our viewers asking, is there anyone alive with, with no Neanderthal DNA? I can't answer that one for the whole world population, <laughs> but um, we know that even in Africa where it was thought there wasn't Neanderthal DNA, uh, really detailed studies show that there are tiny traces even in some African populations where we wouldn't have expected Southern Africa. So I'm not a geneticist. I can't be sure of very, very low, negligible, let, let's shall we say, levels of Neanderthal DNA. But I certainly couldn't say there's no one alive that doesn't mm. have it. Now, Chris, we had a, a question earlier from one of our viewers asking uh, why or how Neanderthals became extinct. Do we have any idea? Yeah, that's uh, one of the really bad, and I still don't have a, a clear answer. So I think the presence of modern humans is a factor. Uh, the fact that there were, as we've seen, at least five different kinds of humans around 70,000 years ago, now there's only one. These other species, as far as we know, went extinct after modern humans came into their territories. So I think there is a connection, but I don't know the exact, I don't think there's a single factor that explains why those groups disappeared. So in the case of Neanderthals, we know they had relatively low genetic diversity out of their time. They were relatively low in numbers. And perhaps the presence of a competing species, uh, hunting the same animals, collecting the same plant resources, wanting to live in the best environments, perhaps that was enough to push them over the edge to extinction. Um, the climates at the time were also very unstable. That may have been a factor. Um, but also, as I say, it's not just the question of the Neanderthals. We have to, and Luzonensis uh, go extinct as well. So. For a global explanation, I don't have that. I don't think anyone does yet, but it's something that obviously we're actively researching. Uh, it's a question a, a number of our viewers have been been asking is, 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 is precisely that, did we modern humans drive Neanderthals to extinction? We can't be sure, but it's a bit of a smoking gun. Well, I would say it's a factor, but uh, we may not even have intentionally meant to make the Neanderthals extinct. There are many species around the world now going extinct without us wanting to, to you know, orangutans. If you remove their, they go extinct. So we don't necessarily intend them to go extinct, but because of our behavior, they do die out. And even the Neanderthals, there may not have been an intentional modern human view to, to make the Neanderthals extinct. And clearly there was interbreeding. So some mm. people believe that the Neanderthals went extinct because a larger modern human population simply absorbed them through interbreeding. And thus they disappeared by being a small population absorbed into a much larger one. So there's a lot still to learn about this. Absolutely. It's a huge, huge question for, for human origins research uh, generally. Uh, speaking of extinctions, we had an interesting question from YouTube asking, did Neanderthals have any influence on the extinction of the megafauna around at the time? 
um, for the Neanderthals, they certainly were exploiting that megafauna, but they'd been doing it for tens of thousands of years without those species going extinct. The difference, unfortunately, seems to come with the spread of modern humans. The spread of modern humans seems to make a greater impact on the megafauna than the Neanderthals or Denisovans or other human species did. In a sense, you could say that those earlier species were living maybe in somewhat of a better balance with, with the, the plants and animals around them. They were in smaller numbers, less exploitative, but with modern humans, with growing numbers, uh, going into new environments, the impact of our species has obviously been much greater than the impact of those earlier human species. Mm. Uh, we've had a, a, a few more questions from our, our viewers online, some, from some of our younger viewers as well. Rosie, age seven, has asked, do we know uh, the Neanderthal lifespan? span? How, how long did they live, live roughly? their lifespan. So we think uh, most Neanderthals were dead by the age of 30. So life was relatively short. And that would have been true, of course, for m most early human populations. Life was very hard for these populations. They had to work very hard to survive. Um, and so they died relatively early compared with us today. Um, there are Neanderthals that are thought to be maybe 50 years, maybe 60 years old at death, but those are relatively rare. Chris, we had a question uh, linked to that from uh, Facebook. Is there any evidence um, that they cared for the elderly? They lived in family structures and they cared for the elderly. Yes, I mean, we think Neanderthals were in family structures, but we don't know the nature of Neanderthal social that Old individuals and sick individuals were looked after for periods of time. So there's a famous individual from a cave in Iraq, uh, buried there in Shanidar Cave, and that individual was crippled, uh, possibly blind in one eye, um, and uh, maybe partially deaf. Yet that individual, probably unable to go out and hunt and gather their own food, it looks like they survived in, for many years with these uh, disabling injuries. So yes, there was care for Neanderthal individuals. Um, and some people see burial as an extension of that care. You've cared for someone up to the time they died. You care for them by burying them after they, after they have died. Uh, we've had a, a lovely, uh, quite a few of our younger viewers, I think on YouTube and Facebook have been asking, do we know if Neanderthals kept pets and kept animals? Did they have pets? Is that the question? <laughs> yeah. Yes, uh, we, we don't have evidence for that. Um, I mean, it's a lovely question. I, I'd, I'd like to think Neanderthals did keep uh, pets, but um, I, I'm sure Neanderthal children w might have, uh, you know, encountered young individuals of different species and, and maybe even did keep them. Uh, but we've no direct evidence of it proper domestication of animals such as cats and dogs seems to have been something that came later with modern humans. But yeah, I think it's a lovely idea that Neanderthals, especially Neanderthal children, could have kept uh, little young animals uh, as pets. Yeah, why not? <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Now, Chris, we had a, we've had a question about, the, about language again, uh, this one on Facebook. Um, do we know when modern humans began to develop language? And is there an overlap between the development of language and interbreeding with Neanderthals? Could this indicate that we were somehow able to communicate with them? Yeah, I think the question of interbreeding and um, what it meant for communication is a very difficult one. Obviously, when we look at how that interbreeding happened, we really don't know if it was friendly or you might say more hostile. Um, some modern hunter-gatherer groups um, run out of uh, female individuals and chimpanzee groups run out of female individuals, and they will go and steal some from another group. 
So maybe that's what happened in some cases. In other cases, uh, you could have uh, adopting uh, orphan babies into a group. That also, of course, would lead to interbreeding when those babies have grown older. Um, there could have even been, you know, relatively friendlier exchanges uh, between Neanderthal and modern human groups. So all of those are possibilities. I don't know what it tells us about communication, um, because obviously, you know, these groups would have evolved for hundreds of thousands of years. They would have had completely different means of communication, far more different, we would guess, than any modern human groups. Maybe even their facial signaling was different. Uh, we all smile at each other and have, you know, expressions that we recognize. Who knows if Neanderthals had even the, the same body language or uh, recognition uh, as we do. These are things we really don't know, but certainly the mm. interbreeding happened. Certainly hybrid children were brought up successfully in modern human groups or we wouldn't have the Neanderthal DNA today. Um, now, what was the other part of that question? Oh, it, it, yeah, whether the interbreeding indicates that we were we were able to communicate with them in, in some way. We must have been, but whether that's language is questionable. Well, there obviously was bodily communication uh, for the <laughs> interbreeding to happen. But how much more there was, we, we can't <laughs> say. Um, the Neanderthals were capable uh, of learning a modern human language. That's a fascinating question to, to consider. Uh, we, you know, we really don't have the information to answer that one. Now, Chris, we're, we're almost out of time, but I just want to take a couple more, squeeze in a couple more questions uh, from our viewers. Henry, aged eight, wants to know, are there any differences between the tools that Neanderthals were making and those made by early modern humans? Um, so in detail, there are some differences which we see in, in certainly later on at the very end of the time of Neanderthals and modern humans. Uh, modern hu humans were developing much more complex and varied tools, uh, making much greater use of bone and antler and iron. Uh, but the Neanderthals were doing this to an extent. So it's a matter of uh, um, degree, not a, not of kind. And the Neanderthals had capabilities. They were excellent tool makers, uh, um, and so I think modern humans. You know, if we go back a hundred thousand years, the differences between these two groups in technologies uh, would have been very small, it seems. But by the time we get to forty thousand years ago, I think the differences are developing and getting much stronger. Uh, and a very interesting question from YouTube on uh, Neanderthal development. Uh, did they reach maturity quicker than Homo sapiens? Yes, there's, there are different views on this. So there had been a view around that Neanderthals grew up much faster than we did. Um, the evidence, again, has got more complex. There's much more overlap. So there's possibly evidence that Neanderthals irritated their wisdom teeth at a, a slightly earlier age than, than we do on average. So maybe they had a, a slightly shorter growth period, a sh slightly shorter adolescence uh, period before they became adult. So I think even for earlier humans, of course, um, life was very demanding and maybe there were advantages in, in getting that growth and development through as quickly as possible. Uh, so there's less period of dependency and people can start to provision and look after themselves uh, at an earlier age. So I think there would have been pressure on these populations to mature earlier. Um, but I think the gap between us and Neanderthals, again, is, as in many cases, as we're seeing, was much less than we used to think. Absolutely. They're, they're far more complex than, than we, we ever imagined, say, 10 or 20 years ago. Now, Chris, we are almost out of time, but just before we go, one more question. Obviously, we've been focusing on the Neanderthals for this talk, um, but our evolutionary tree gets ever more complex with more finds and, and more advanced techniques, uh, like uh, being able to sequence DNA. Could there be more species of human out there to be discovered? 
Yeah, I, th I think almost certainly there are. When we look at the surprises of the last few years, um, I think you know, we've seen Homo floresiensis, uh, Homo nusinensis in those islands in Southeast Asia. There are many more islands there uh, which could have similar experiments, if you like, in human evolution going on on them uh, to be discovered. And even in a place like Africa, we have the recent discovery of Homo naledi in South Africa, an area where we supposedly knew pretty well what was going on in human evolution. And there's an entirely new species discovered there. So I think Africa, we know from stone tools that people were living over Africa for most of the last two million years. And yet from areas like Central and West Africa, we have more or less no fossil evidence to tell us who was living there for most of that time. So probably 90% of Africa still has to yield fossil evidence. So who knows what's still to come, even from Africa, let alone huge areas of Asia and those islands of Southeast Asia. That's a, a brilliant uh, point to end on, I think, Chris. Thank you so much for talking to us today. It's been absolutely fascinating. Um, it's a it's an ever-changing topic, and I hope that you'll be back to talk to us again at some point. <laughs> Uh, yes, I very much look forward to that. And of course, I'm sure you're going to refer people to our web web resources where there's much more information on human evolution to look at. Absolutely. Our, our Discover pages on human evolution contain a wealth of information. So, so absolutely check those out. A lot on Neanderthals as well. But Chris, thank you again. We'll say goodbye to you for now, but hope to see you again soon. Bye, everybody. <laughs> Thank you all so much for all of your questions. I apologise, we, uh, we had a little bit of a connection issue, I know, but thank you for bearing with us and for all of your brilliant questions. I, I'm sorry if we didn't get to all of them. There, there were lots of them, but thank you so much. It, it's been brilliant. We will be doing Nature Live again on Friday. We'll be uh, talking about the, the, the biodiversity, the wonderful nature that you can find on your doorstep. So do remember to tune into that one. That's at 10.30 on Friday. Day. And our regular program is Tuesday at 12 and at 10.30 on a Friday. So do join us again. But for now, I'll say goodbye. Take care and we'll see you soon.